Anti-dihydroxylation is an alkene addition reaction where we add two hydroxy groups to the carbons of the alkene and they add anti to each other, which means one is going to be pointing up and the other is going to be pointing down with respect to the original alkene. So let's, let's start by drawing the product of this reaction. We're going to keep the two things that are already attached to the each of the carbons of the alkene, and then we're going to be putting two OH groups onto the carbons of the alkene anti to each other in this sort of formation. This reagent, RCO3H, is a peroxide reagent that's used for anti-dihydroxylation. There are three common versions of RCO3H. This would be just a generic formula for a peroxy acid. I want to I want to start by drawing what this actually would look like. So this is kind of like a carboxylic acid slash peroxide mixed together. It's got that extra oxygen in there. The three most common peroxy acids that are used for this reaction are a peroxy acetic acid, so CH3CO3H, and then also two other reagents, MMPP, which stands for magnesium monoperoxy phthalate, and MCPBA, which stands for metachloroperoxy benzoic acid, which you don't need to remember either one of these uh, in terms of what they stand for or know what their structure looks like. You just need to recognize these reagents when you see them and know that they are peroxy acids and that they will do this sort of a reaction. We're not going to look at the mechanism for this reaction. We're just going to jump straight to examples for this reaction. Um, but before we get into that, let's just go over the conditions very quickly in terms of predicting the products. As I've already mentioned, we have anti-addition of the two OH groups. And then, of course, that means that stereochemistry, when we're drawing our products, if we have an asymmetrical alkene, stereochemistry is going to take some time. It's not complicated, but it's, uh, it's doable, but it just takes some effort. And also, we have no carbocation rearrangement. So our carbo carbon skeleton doesn't change. Let's take a look at a couple of examples. Um, so here are two different alkenes with the reagents that we need for this reaction. And when I'm drawing the products of this reaction, I always start by drawing out my carbon skeleton. And I know that I'm gonna be drawing two OH groups, one on each carbon of the original alkene, just like that and I'm gonna be drawing them in opposite directions with respect to each other. Now, I don't necessarily know that they're gonna end up like that, the way that I just have drawn it, or maybe they're gonna end up like that. Actually, they're gonna end up in both possible scenarios, so I need to draw two different products. One product where my OH groups are in this orientation, and one product where my OH groups are in this orientation. So they're always anti to each other, but in terms of is the left one up or is the left one down, we have to draw both. Now, now we have drawn out the two constitutional isomers, uh, or two versions, carbon skeletons of this molecule. Now what we need to do is take a look at the carbons that we worked on and ask ourselves if either of those carbons are chiral, because if they are, we have to deal with wedges and dashes. This carbon has a methyl, an ethyl, an OH group, and other stuff, so this carbon is chiral. This carbon has a methyl, a hydrogen, an OH, and this stuff, so they're both chiral. And with, when both carbons are chiral, We've got to be careful about representing the stereochemistry accurately. So the easiest way to do that is to go back to the original alkene, pick two groups that are cis to each other, make both of those groups wedges or dashes. It doesn't matter. Just make them the same and then maintain that through the whole entire reaction. So the ethyl on the left and the methyl on the right are always going to be wedges. And then go back to the alkene again and take the other two groups that are cis to each other 
and make both of them dashes and follow that through as well. Now, when you get here and you've got it, I accidentally put an H there. When you get here and you have to draw in that dash hydrogen, remember that your wedge and your dash are always side by side and your straight bonds are always side by side. So don't push the, put the dash here because it's not side by side with the wedge. So put in our dash hydrogen side by side with our wedge and there are the two products for this reaction. Let's take a look at our next example. So we're gonna start with the carbon skeleton. We're going to put two OH groups on that, uh, two carbons of the alkene like this. And remember that we know that while well, one is pointing up and one is pointing down, the left-hand carbon could be either up or down, so we have to draw both possibilities. Now let's look at the two carbons that we worked on and ask ourselves if those two carbons became chiral. This carbon right here has one, two, three, four different things attached, so this is a chiral carbon. This chi carbon has two hydrogens, so it is achiral, and that's wonderful. When one of our carbons is achiral, we don't have to put any wedges and dashes on that carbon at all. In addition to not having to put wedges and dashes, it makes the stereochemistry of this carbon very easy to represent also. So we'll just draw this guy with a wedge. We'll erase this whole thing over here. And we will draw an enantiomer with the OH group on a dash. And that's it.